Welcome to Relationship Real Talk, Live the Lives podcast. For over 20 years, we have been dedicated to strengthening marriage and family through relationship education. Our core goals are to reduce the Florida divorce rate by 50% by 2029, to increase the marriage rate and reduce teen pregnancy and out of wedlock births. For more information about us, you can visit us at livethelife.org. Welcome everybody. You may be familiar with Live the Life, but do you know the whole story? You may not know that it involved a Christian music rock star, Michael W. Smith, or a president before he was president, or a woman telling her husband that she was done with their marriage and how that one act has impacted hundreds of thousands of people. Well, today we get the good and the bad and the ugly with Richard Albertson, who started Live the Life back in 1998. So, Richard, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Uh, it's great to be with you guys. Yeah, great to be with you guys. How you doing today? Very good. Thanks for having me. All right, we're going to jump right in because I'm sure the story is super detailed. First question. Tell us a little bit about you and Miss Elizabeth's love story. How it began, how you fell in love, how you proposed, planning a wedding, et cetera. <clears throat> well, I'm, I used to be in politics. Mm-hmm. I'm a recovering politician, and uh, I was working on the George Bush campaign, and I was flying down to um, uh, Miami to do an event, a fundraiser, and uh, Elizabeth's brother, Walter, uh, was going to pick me up at the airport. And uh, he, at the last minute, decided that he was not going to pick me up at the airport. He had his sister come get me at the airport, and that was Elizabeth. And so she picked me up, and uh, I'm like, uh, they didn't have cell phones back then. So I'm like, okay, you're picking me up. And so, and she's like, yeah, I just got this new car. I'm like, that's great. I'm so cool that you got a new car, you know? And so instead of driving me to Walter's house where I'm supposed to be staying, she goes to see her friend and show her friend the new car. So I had to get out of the car and meet another total stranger and look at my new car. And so they all came out and then, Okay, we got back in the car. Did we go to Walter's house? No. We went to another friend's house, and she ran, oh, look at my new car. And so I got out of the car again and met another total stranger. She took you, you around you know, the block. She took me everywhere to show, <laughs> meet all these strangers to show them the new car. So it was kind of an interesting experience. I was kind of like, I thought it was pretty funny. Could, uh, I've got things to do. Could, I didn't say this, mm-hmm. but I'm like, could we, could we kind of move this Speed along? Speed it up a little bit. Yeah. But I was intrigued by how sweet she was and how, you know, she was just having, she was just having fun going to see her friends. Mm-hmm. Wow. So that's that how we first hilarious. met. Now, if you ask her, she'll tell you a different story. So she she remembers a different story when we first met. So it's a controversy. Most couples have that the way they first met. So yeah, the complete opposite yeah. side. But so, the correct story, the correct story is the one that I just. Well, said. Of, that's, course, that's, of course, of course. So that's so that. yeah, go into more of your story. How did you fall in love? How did you propose? Well, um, we uh, we spent time together, got to know each other. I was very nervous because I am. Uh, I'm not real good around females unless they're friends. Mm-hmm. I get very sweaty and I was scared to death. I was terrified. I didn't think she was interested in me at all. Um, and then her brother, Walter, said, are you ever going to ask my sister out on a date? And I went, like, she, she would go out with me? He said, yes. I'm like, you're kidding me. Because, I mean, Elizabeth, you've seen her. She's a babe. She is hot. You know, get the brownie points. She's very sexy. I'm telling you. And I'm like, there's no way she's going to go out with me. He says, no, she will. I'm like, oh, okay. So I didn't know what to do. So I asked some friends. I asked, I asked uh, Treya, uh, your Aunt, Aunt Treya, a friend of ours, <clears throat> and Tanya. And I said, well, what should I do? She said, well, you know, do something kind of more laid back and not too heavy, mm-hmm. like an official date. Do something kind of in between, like, she's like, what do you need at your, I had just bought a, a townhouse. You know, maybe she could help you go do some shopping and pick up some mm-hmm. stuff for your, for your place. That. I'm like, okay, that's a good idea, <laughs> because I don't have good taste. I mean, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not good at that. So <clears throat> we went, I said, hey, would you like to help me go pick out some lamps for the for my townhouse? And she said, sure. And I'm like, really? You'll, you'll go with me? And she said, yeah, I'll go. And I'm like, okay. So we went out, and we went shopping, and we got some pink lamps mm. I know you'll that's be, how you know, know he was in love yeah, yeah. and so, we had those lamps until probably like five years ago they are still in the attic <laughs> okay they're in and the your, attic. your mother oh tried gosh. to throw them away and i said really you our are lamps. gonna throw away our, our lamps, lamps? <laughs> our how, love could lamps? You, how could you throw those away that was our first day <laughs> that is that is hilarious she so, got yeah. you early <laughs> oh yeah yeah and so then after that i said well you want to go see a movie and she said, yeah, let's go see a movie. So we went to see The Princess Bride, mm. which was the, our very first movie, our very first date together. And that was a perfect movie because it's a guy story and it's a girl story. You know, it's, it's got the adventure and the excitement and the fun. It's comedy. And there's, it's got a sweet romance. So it's like the perfect 
first date movie. And you have to know, he also told my mom that this amazing romantic movie Alien. Wait, what was oh, it? Yes. It was, it was it's Alien. Alien. <laughs> yeah, well, I got her. You're going to love it, Elizabeth. She had to become a Star Trek fan. to, In order for this relationship to work, she had to be a Star Trek fan. And she had never really paid attention to it. So I got her watching it. And we actually watched it on our honeymoon. We watched all the movies up until that time on our honeymoon. Jesus. And she loved it. So I'm like, okay, this could work. This could work. And, <laughs> uh, yeah. And then she, and then when Alien, and I wanted her to see mm. Alien, she does not like scary movies. If you know Elizabeth, that is not her thing. So I said, honey, it's like sci-fi. It's a sci-fi movie. She says, okay. It's like Star Trek. <laughs> it's like Star Trek. So she, that's what she thought because I said, it's a sci-fi movie. So she thought, anyway, we watch it. And, of course, the scene where the mm-hmm. alien comes out, Come she's out. like, she is <laughs> freaking out. So, yeah. yeah. So I have a very dark sense of humor that, you know, yeah. kept us, kept things interesting over the years. So you're kind of painting this picture of Elizabeth where she's a super sweet, super loving, awesome woman. And um, you, you've neglected to tell the story where you – you kind of gave her uh, this idea that she was going to be meeting the president, which is oh, how yeah. she went to an event with you. Oh. <laughs> but that actually Bridget. wasn't the well, case. I didn't, I didn't say she was going to meet the president. Okay, I said, down, would you like to meet George Bush? And she said. Who was the president at the time? He was the vice president or vice at president. this time. He was running for president. Mm-hmm. He was on the campaign. So it was a campaign event over in Jacksonville. And I said, would you like to meet George Bush? He said, she said, yeah. So we got in the car and we drove over and we were doing this event. And so I said, I need you to keep, uh, you know, George Bush, keep him, Mr. Bush um, occupied because I got to go do all this other stuff. So she spent a couple hours hanging out with George Bush. And as soon as she met him, she's like, that's not George Bush. It's his son, George, George w. w. Bush. And she's like, oh, my gosh. She was so <laughs> disappointed because she thought she was going to meet the future president. And so she felt like, I've got I've to entertain this guy, you know, this whole time while Richard's getting to have all the fun. Mm-hmm. He's doing all this other stuff with all the donors and all the things like that. And I'm stuck with this guy that's, you know, he's not going to be the president. And, and of lo course, and lo and behold, <laughs> she actually did meet a future president, but at the time, you know, yeah, he was just, he was just the son. She was being gypped. That's hilarious. Yeah, so she thought she was being gypped. You have this <laughs> wonderful, amazing woman that fell in love with you and will, you know, We'll never know why. No, I'm just kidding. You're pretty great, too. <laughs> I, I, seriously, I, do, I don't know how I got so lucky. And really you had don't. some, there was some drama with your engagement, and you're getting married, and your her parents were like, no, this isn't happening, called off the wedding multiple times. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's, that's just a fun way to start out your marriage. So tell us a little bit about the year, early years of your marriage. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't want to go too into, into the into that into ne- negative stuff, but because um, her, you know, some people might be listening. So anyway, um, we uh, we had a great time. We were dinks. If y'all never heard of dinks, it's double income, no kids, and that was a big thing back then. So we we had two incomes. We could we could go out to eat whenever we wanted. We could go to movies. We could spend money. We could go do things because we had yeah, we had two incomes, and we had one place. It was just it was amazing, and we would. We lived up in D.C. We would go to parties and we would watch the fireworks on the White House lawn where all the tourists are outside the fence and we were, you know, the... Up here on the on the lawn of the White House, and Pinkies people, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are, as we're drinking our, our tea on the lawn, and you know, we would also have um, when when if friends would come in, we would go to the White House and we would take them through the Oval Office and do the special VIP stuff, and mm-hmm. and then I would often have when I would know when the president was coming in with the helicopter, so we would schedule it so we're walking on the White House lawn as the president's as the helicopter's coming. coming in for landing, and that was really exciting because it was it's quite a rush because you're like wait a minute, mm-hmm. and then the president lands and you're standing there on the lawn. It's pretty, there was pretty, some pretty cool stuff. Ashley was there for one of those when she was first born. And that's one of our stories on Ashley. She was very, (laughs) she was a very young girl. I almost died. (laughs) She was a very young girl and they have a roped off section Mm -hmm. where the secret service will not let you go past that. That's security zone. So stay behind the rope. Well, you know, she's two years old and she just, she just decides to run out on the white house lawn and she's dancing and running and playing. And the secret service men are looking at me like, and so I lift, I lifted up the rope to try to go over, and then, and he just went. 
He just <laughs> shook his head. No, you are not going. And I'm like, Ashley, come to daddy. <laughs> Ashley. And she laughs. Ha, ha, ha. You're so funny because she's <laughs> not I'm not, not known. And, and so I'm, it took everything we had to coerce her. She got back in the rope line just in time when the helicopter was coming. I think the sound of the helicopter probably scared her. And she came running back to us. So, oh, Ashley dodged, was trying to get in, in the middle yeah. of everything. It was, quite a, it was quite a time. Yeah, it was fun. We had a great, we had a great time. We also watched the fireworks on top of the ag building where, where my office was, Department mm-hmm. of Agriculture, and it's right there where the Washington Monument is. So literally, that's the closest place you could yeah. possibly get to see the fireworks on the 4th of July. And we would go up on the roof, which you only do it once a year. Mm-hmm. It was really... It was like a dream. I mean, how in the world do we get to do all that stuff? It was pretty amazing. So. Yeah. Like y'all were having a ball. We yeah. had a great time. We had an adventure. It was exciting. So you have this amazing, you, you're in love, you're married, you're young, you've got this two incomes. So tell us a little bit about uh, where everything started to go. Maybe not so the right way. <laughs> well, you know, um, everything was going fine until Chip was born. No, it's not really Chip's fault. <laughs> no, we were just, uh, we were actually teaching the marriage class at our church. This is after DC, we moved down to Clearwater Mm -hmm. and um, we were teaching a marriage class at the church and uh, it was Gary Smalley's Love is Decision and they asked, how would you rate your marriage on a scale of one to 10? And I gave it a 9.5 because I won all the arguments. And Elizabeth (laughs) gave it a a two. I was like, Elizabeth, honey, two is the low score. You know, 10 is the high score. I think you got this backwards. She says, I know. Mm-hmm. And we're teaching the class. Sheesh. We're the leaders of the class. <laughs> well, like Houston, we got a problem here. There yeah. is this is not okay. And I'm, I was very I was very upset. Be like, what? You're embarrassing me in front of all these people. Tell us I've got a two. And so I got out a legal pad and I started to write down a whole list of things to help her get her scores up. And I had all kinds of suggestions on how she could become a better wife. Mm-hmm. You know how she could be more helpful. I mean, I just had all kinds of things that she, if she would just straighten out, mm-hmm. we could have a great marriage. Yeah, how did she take that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she did not take that. It made things worse, and that's where she kind of said, you know, things didn't change in the marriage. She wanted a divorce, mm-hmm. and again, I'm like, what are you talking about? You don't have any grounds for a divorce. There is no adultery. There's no. There's none of that. What are you? Why in the world are you going to break up this marriage? And Ashley's just a little girl. Rachel's just a little girl. Why are you? going to ruin their lives. You're going to ruin my life. You know, my life came flashing before my eyes. Like, what is going on? And um, it just really, it was kind of like a deer in the headlights moment. It was kind of one of those defining moments that we all have in life. And I said, you know what? I better figure this out. I better figure out how this thing's going to work. Because so many of us guys, we we get married Mm -hmm. and then we go to work. You know, we kind of focus on that, and I'm going to do this, and I'm 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 check I checked off the box, I checked off the marriage box. Now I'm going to go over here and do this, and I just didn't know any better, and I didn't I didn't realize there's so many things I did not realize because no one ever told me this stuff, and I never I never got this guidance. So, so anyway, it 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 got it you know things got worse and better and up and down. It was a roller coaster ride, and we had to learn a, th- a lot of things the hard way, and um, so it it's it was very humbling. But it really convicted us that, convicted me and her that mm-hmm. after we got through that crisis and then your brother Chip was born and, you know, things started to turn around a little bit. And then I, I was getting fired from this job. That's a whole nother story. But that actually kind of brought us together and helped us solidify because now we're together dealing with this mm-hmm. versus mm-hmm. now that's just another thing on top of everything else. And that actually helped us, it helped me realize that, you know, actually sharing and confiding and opening up and letting someone know what you're going through like oh my gosh i'm gonna lose my job to share that with her actually brought us closer together so there's a lot of things i learned i had to learn i'm still learning but that really gave us that conviction that you know years later we said you know we don't want other couples to go through what we went through and not have that help and not have those resources and people just didn't know how most couples just don't know how to be married and i thought we were the only ones most Mm -hmm. couples think yeah we're the only ones that are struggling with A, B, and C. No. Most couples are dealing with A, B, and C. And yeah. so you get isolated and you think you're the only ones. And we, we thought we were the only ones. So that really made us convicted to start Live a Life, you know, a few years after that. It's when we, we launched and jumped yeah. off the cliff. Yeah. And I would say, too, you hit that mark right at that five to seven year mark where most couples yep. hit that okay, we're in it or we're out of it. Like that's usually when a couple, five to seven years is when the couple will say either we're having big problems or we're done. Yep. 
That's exactly right. It's yeah. a very normal thing. And a lot of times it's with kids because mm-hmm. kids add a lot of stress into the marriage and a lot of stress into the relationship. And so it's kind of natural because all of a sudden we got these kids. And by the way, a lot of these guys just go off to work and they focus on that. And, mm-hmm. you know, the ladies do it too. They go off to work and the marriage just kind of gets becomes second, then third, then fourth, then fifth, and the priority and everything mm-hmm. else comes in front yeah. of that, and it becomes the last thing on the list. And that's that's how Elizabeth felt. She felt like she was the last person on the list, the low man on the totem pole. Yeah. And that's not what I meant mm-hmm. to send, but my actions were not lining up with what I knew and what I felt. So yeah. I just had to learn a lot. Mm-hmm. And just um, not to go back a little bit before, but you said that y'all were uh, working with marriages in your church. What made y'all get into that, even just starting there well we had other couples that we were friends with and mm-hmm. we enjoyed being with and living life together and doing things with and we thought oh, we should do a marriage retreat you know it'd be a good way to enrich okay. our marriage mm-hmm. and let's do this i mean i'm i'm totally oblivious i'm thinking oh it's a good idea yeah, you know it was good I she probably was, was like well finally he's finally. gonna learn something and you know she's like yeah that <laughs> is a Elizabeth good idea back, richard like, yeah. and he's like yeah we can lead others because we're so amazing and she's in the back just plotting. she's like yeah. oh finally yeah. he's gonna learn <laughs> yeah, yeah she 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 probably did all that well and the other thing was that was funny is that Gary Smalley would say things and I would go, that is so profound. I can't believe that is so good. And she says, honey, I've been telling you that for five years. You know, I've been saying, <laughs> so but when true. Gary Smalley says it, you really <laughs> listen to him. Listen. But I've been telling you this stuff. And she, you know, honestly, she was right. I, she had been trying to, t- but I just didn't have ears to hear it. Sometimes, sometimes us guys are hard headed and we need to hear it from another man. And I, that's not okay. That's messed up. And I'm not saying that's a good strategy, but it's just human nature, the way we are. We, but when we hear it from another man, somehow we hear it better. I don't know why that is. And it's not really fair, but I'm just dealing with the reality of it. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I would say from there, how did Live the Life kind of shape and form? So you went from, oh my gosh, my marriage is in crisis, my wife wants a divorce, to, okay, let's teach other couples how to have a good marriage, to now you're all over Florida, you've been in all different kinds of countries, in a lot of different states the programs have been in. So what happened in the beginning? So how did we start this process? How did Live the Life get its origin? Well, we, we, both of us, you know, I, I just spent a lot of time researching, okay, what does it take to have a healthy marriage? I don't mm-hmm. know. So I started reading books and I started reading articles and I looked around and I went on a hunt and I went on a search to find out what, how to solve that puzzle. At the same time, I also started reading books about how to be a dad and how to be a father and what's the, what are the good things to do? What are you not want to do? And I wanted to do things differently. So I just became a student of all those things. And I really started reading and researching and absorbing good information from lots of different sources. And, you know, we didn't have the internet back then. So, I mean, I'm going to to libraries and I'm going to (laughs) bookstores and I'm asking people and I'm asking, have you read books? And so, you know, it's so much easier now. But back then I had to, I really had to go on a hunt to find all that. And that, that was what amazing. And then when I read the stuff, you know, this is not rocket science. You know, this is not... It's not like it's that difficult. It's just that most people just don't know because no one's ever shared it with them. No one's ever done that. So that really helped us get the ball rolling for Live Life, get it started. And and then it became a learning process. As we started going into it, we started learning. You know, the, the skills are very important because hmm. so many marriage programs around the country, <clears throat> they do a great job and they motivate people and they're exciting them. You know, it's, a, it's good about scripture and, you know, the, the Lord hates divorce and, you know, uh, Husbands love your wives. I mean, there's all kinds of good stuff in there, but the knowledge is not enough. You have to operationalize the knowledge. You have to, what's the practical application of how you do those things? That's what people weren't covering. They were fo- they were focusing on the information, mm-hmm. but they weren't focusing on what's in the heart and how and learning how to mm-hmm. actually do it. Like, I mean, I know I need to lose weight. I mean, people know we shouldn't smoke. We know we shouldn't do these. But how do you operationalize what you know? Mm-hmm. And most human beings, the research is very strong. They have a rough time. They have a, they have a tough time operationalizing something because they don't know how to do it. So that's where we come along with the skills because the skills are so easy to learn. And that was one of the aha moments over the years. Like that is when you can show them how to do it and they realize, I just did that. That wasn't that difficult. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't that hard. And actually we're closer now after we did that. And that worked out. It was immediately. They're like, okay, I I can do this. And you give them confidence that they can do it without necessarily having a therapist. And you know, nothing wrong with therapists. That's great. Um, 
but that I can do this on my own and we can learn how to do this ourselves. That's yeah. That's secret sauce. So explain, because I find it interesting, you, because you're building this business to where it is now. So building the business, researching, actually researching since the internet wasn't <laughs> wasn't a thing back then. How, where was the balance between researching and setting up the structure and actually practicing it? Because I know even now we get caught up in, yeah, we can teach it, but sometimes we forget to do our own skills that we teach other people. So explain what was that balance like? Well, that's one of the hardest things for me, you know, that to this day, I still try to, I still try to figure out that balance mm -hmm. between, you know, working hard, doing a good job, doing everything with excellence, really trying to make a difference here in my career, but also making sure that my home life is good and that, that my wife knows that, that I love her, that my kids know that. Trying to find that right balance is one of the most difficult things I've ever done. And it's still difficult to this day, even though most of our kids are grown, it's still hard because I get so caught up in that, that work and I don't understand the work-life balance. And a lot of us get our identity from our work, you know, and if I get all these accolades and all the stuff at work, then that's where my identity comes from. And, and that's not the best way to get it. It's, it's really good to have that, that balance. So, you know, one of the things that I grew up with, and, you know, you guys might have heard me talk about integrity, that, you know, my definition of integrity is I grew up in a home with my dad where the people that knew him least loved and respected him the most. These were his students. These were the people at, at, at Florida High that just loved my dad. And, oh, he's a great coach. And they would come up to me all the time. Your dad is like a father to me. And, you know, you've seen him. They'd come, they'd come into Sunny's and wherever we go, oh, your coach, you were like a father to me. I get that all the time. And I think it's great that they had that experience with my dad, that he really was like a father to them at school. But when he came home, <laughs> the people that knew him best mm -hmm. loved and respected him the least. Mm -hmm. See, that's not integrity. That's not good to me. That a lot of people do that. They're really, they got this one face over here and then there's somebody else over here. And that's just not integrity. It's, there's some human nature in that. There's our flesh, there's our brokenness, there's our sin nature and all that, which is part of it. But I, I decided very early on that I want the people that know me best mm -hmm. to love and respect me the most because they know me best. And that was my definition of integrity. So I, I said, you know what? I want it to be where if people want to know who I am as a husband, as a friend, as a father, don't ask me because I'm going to give you a blown up answer. I'm going to, mm -hmm. we all have our egos. We all have our pride. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me. Give you a 9.5. I'm going to give you that 9.5. <laughs> I'm going to bring all those things. Time. So don't ask me because we're all going to inflate that score, right? Mm -hmm. Ask Elizabeth. How would you rate Rich, your marriage with Richard on a scale of one to ten? Ask her. You can ask her. You know, you you have my permission to ask her because <laughs> that's a way of accountability. Because mm -hmm. if she gets asked that question, I want her giving me a high score, right? I, I want that. Ashley, hey Ashley, what was it like growing up with him? What kind of a father was he then, and what kind of a father is he now? And whatever Ashley tells you, that's the right answer. You know, with my friends, hey, what kind of a friend is he? You know, was he is he just like that way? But in real life, he's really not a good friend. Mm -hmm. So. I want, I want that to be in alignment. I want those people, people that you work for. Hey, hey, Alfonso, what's it like working for Richard? Um, Great. And so, well, but I Just mean, but seriously. <laughs> but seriously, what do you say when I'm not in the room? You know, when mm -hmm. people, when people are asking you, what's it like living there? The answer you give tells people what kind of a boss I am. Not what I say and not what I send out on an email and mm -hmm. the public face and the, you know, the, 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 you know, the newsletters and all that. So what do you say? What do you say? What do the employees say? What's been their experience? Because a lot of times that's just, it doesn't sink. And we have a lot of that, not just in businesses and nonprofits, but in the Christian world and churches, that's not in sync. And that's, that's a problem. Yeah. So I, I have tried and I have not done it perfectly, but it has definitely been one of my goals. So that was a long answer to your question. About balance, <laughs> but I love it. Though. Yeah. <laughs> Took us through the whole thing. So from, DC to you learning that your marriage is in shambles. Where where is live the life live the life now? How would you say where? Ugh, can't even speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, where are we now? Yeah, it's it's so cool to me because I look back on it and it blows my mind because I I really never thought we'd be outside of Tallahassee. No, oh, really. And I thought Tallahassee. Let's just do it here. I mean, this is going to take a lifetime. In my mind, that's that was what it was going to take. And 
to be in, in four offices and have four regional offices doing this and doing this in, what, 33 states? And I think we're, we've gone to 12 countries so far. I, I, I have, that totally blows my mind. And I often think about it. I think I want to do something over there to kind of illustrate there. Our first year's budget was, you know, $60,000. From A to Z, from everything. You know, that was back in the days when people would call up and say, and they'd <laughs> ring the phone, Rip, good afternoon, live the life. This is Richard. Hey, Richard, how you doing? Hey, I just need to talk to someone in your accounting department. Please hold. Richard. Live the life. <laughs> accounting. <laughs> Richard Albertson, you know, is the same person. I mean, I did everything. Right. Just with the newsletters yeah. and the mailings and folding the envelopes and print, doing everything. Wow with a little old $60,000, and that was just such a tiny beginning. And and then it took us, I think it took us like, um, I don't know, I think it took eight years to cross the, I think it took 10 years to get to our first million dollars, and then it got to an, an eight years to get to the second million dollars, and then after that it took three years to get to $3 million. Oh, wow. And this year we're pushing $4 million. So from little old 60000 to that, yeah, that's... It's it's very humbling. It's very and who knows where it's going to go. I mean, it, it keeps growing. It's at the point now. I can't even stay on top of it. I can't stay ahead of it. We we don't. We have to keep hiring people because it's hard to it's hard to keep up with. That's that's wow. That's amazing. <laughs> so looking back and having this incredible journey, is there anything that you look back and say, I I wish I could have done that a little differently? Well, yeah, from a from a human perspective, you look you always second guess yourself and go back and look at things. I wish I had done this. I wish I had done that. <clears throat> you know, the biggest one on that is going to be people that I hired that I should not have hired. Um, and there's still repercussions from some of those decisions. You know, I didn't know any better at the time, but if I had known now what I know, you know, if I had known it back then, I never would have hired <clears throat> some of these people, and they. They've done destructive things, and the yeah. buck stops here. I mean, I have to, I have to live with that, and I have to own that. And I wish I could go back and, and redo that. I, I can't. I yeah. just, I can't. And that, that hurts. That really hurts because I want to, I want to rewind that. Tape, well, and also, you don't really have control over that yeah. either. It's yeah. not like you knew and still did it. It was like that was blindsiding th- that people would betray trust like that. But on the flip side, what have been some of your favorite moments from this journey? Well, yeah, you know. I would say from a, looking at the the things doing differently, from a heavenly perspective, I, I wouldn't change anything mm. from a heavenly perspective because it, yeah. it taught me very valuable lessons. I, I've had to learn some things the hard way. And I don't know if that's just the way the Lord works. It is the way the Lord works, but it's also it's also sometimes I'm so hard headed, you know, in, in my flesh. I heard that. Yeah. Are you are you raising your hand to relate on that one? <laughs> yeah, she, she, yes. knows her, she knows her father. But we learn more from our you learn more from your mistakes than you do from your from your positives. And yeah, so when you think sure. about yeah, when you think about memories of of things that are there's so there are so many that probably needs to be a separate. <laughs> oh no, that's thing. I mean, you know, doing the community marriage policy in 1999, where we got all those churches together. We had yeah. 70, 75 churches in Tallahassee come together across racial lines, denominational lines, theological lines. We're all going to agree marriage matters in this community. And we're going to wow. do something about it. And they stood together and they signed a document. And we had county commissioners there, the chief of police, city commissioners. Governor Bush came. He was the first governor in the whole country that ever signed a community marriage policy. And they had been done in probably 100 communities at that point. But he was the first governor that actually came and did that. So that's definitely a kind of a high point. Wow. Wow. Another high point was... A very, which was also very humbling as we named Live the Life after the song, <laughs> Live the Life. Now, you, young, you younger folks, millennials, don't really remember Michael W. Smith like we do, but, you know, the, he wrote a song called Live the Life, and I thought, that's a, the words to that are just so good. For the world to know the truth, there can be no greater proof than to live the life, live an authentic life. And that's, mm. that's how mm. people know when, you're, when it's real, they want that. But you've got to live the life in a way that attracts people to Christ. So... My kids were the ones that, you know, and Ashley was one of them that, that would say, hey, Dad, why don't we bring Michael W. Smith to Tallahassee and have him do a concert? And I'm like, okay, the number one Christian artist <laughs> in the world. And we're a little old peon live life. And I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. Sure. You know, sure, yeah, we can get him to come. And, but the, they're, the, it's, like, it's, the, it's just like the Bible. They're like little kids. So I would tuck them in at night, and all three of all of my kids that could speak at the time would say they would pray. 
Lord, please bring Michael W. Smith to Tallahassee. And I'm sitting here hearing this as they're praying this <laughs> night after night after night after night. It's convicting me because they've got more mm-hmm. faith than I do. And I finally, someone, I think it might have been Lynette or your mom or someone that said, you know, why don't we just write him a letter? At least give it a try. I mean, just send a letter out. You never know. Never I'm like, know. okay. So I made a phone call. I a couple phone calls trying to find a who, how and who and whatever. So I wrote a letter and I told him a little bit about Live Life's story. Next thing I know, they called up and said, he wants to come down and do a concert for y'all. And I went, Uh-oh. and of course the kids were like, <laughs> of course. thank you, Lord, of course. <laughs> we knew the Lord was going to answer this prayer. So that was really convicting because the kids had more faith, you know, because they believed that and that faith of a child is so beautiful. So guess what? When Michael W. Smith came to Tallahassee on his private jet, I didn't send all the big donors out to meet him at the airport. I had all those kids that were praying for him to be there. They're the ones that were his little receiving line as he came out because oh, wow. they're the ones that prayed for that because they're the ones that had the faith. Mm-hmm. So he and he he thought that was so cool. He's walking on, shaking all their hands and all that. It was really a, a, a special time. So that was pretty good. The, um, um, I did get to I wrote, I wrote the charter for the National Association for Relationship and Marriage Education. I got to write that. Uh, we have members in 28 states now. And so that was back in 2010. I was honored to write that, and it's still part of the Army's charter. Um, the research that FSU came out with just last year yeah. showing significant mm-hmm. impact six months later and a year later, and they're showing that of all the effect sizes, they've never seen any impact like they've seen through our program. And it's it's so much better than so many of the other programs. Not to knock the other programs. There's other great programs out there. But when ours rose to the top, having the highest effect scores six months later and a year later, I mean that was that was a that was a that was a wow. And there's all there's just so many other ones. I mean I, I think about I think about the guy that was from Hurlbert that um, he was, he was, his wife was going to serve him papers and was going to file for a divorce. Mm. And, you know, Adventures of Marriage is not really designed to save troubled marriages. I mean, it very often does. But that's, that's Hope Weekends. That's not really Adventures of Marriage. So anyway, he comes to this and his marriage is transformed and he, he's all excited about it. And his wife was going to serve him papers on Monday. Well, he comes back to the chaplain office at Hurlbert Field over in Destin, Fort Walton Beach, a year afterwards. And he goes, Chaplain, I got to talk to you. <clears throat> I need to tell you something. He said, you know, you guys invited us to go. Y'all knew our marriage was in trouble. You sent us over there for that. And, you know, my wife had already told me that she's going to go with a retreat, but she's just going to go to go to the beach and have a free weekend, you know, be able to hang out at the beach and get a tan and have a great time. Mm -hmm. Uh, She wasn't interested in going to this retreat. She was just doing it to have a weekend at the beach. And she had already told me she was going to serve papers to me on Monday. Well, you know what? I had already made my mind. They, those papers will never get served to me because I was going to kill myself. Mm. They would never. Wow. I was never going to have that knock on my door serving me papers. He had already made up his mind he was going to kill himself. So he told the chaplain, chaplain, i got to tell you, it's been a total transformation in our marriage and our family. Wow. He said, you didn't just save my marriage, you saved my life. Oh. <laughs> and, of course, he picked wow. up the phone immediately. Yeah. Richard, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> I mean... That was so cool. But there's so many stories like that. There's so many stories that may not always as dramatic as that, but hundreds of them, thousands of them. And that's the most gratifying thing in the world to know that, hey, well, hey, we saved one marriage. You know, we saved one life. It's 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 all worth it. And that's extremely gratifying. Because a lot of times you work in these these fields and you want to help people, you want to make a difference, and you are we making a difference? Are we mm-hmm. are we doing anything that's making? And I think I, y'all can again. Don't yeah. ask me. Ask yeah. you guys. You've yeah. seen it with your own seen eyes. It. You know, mm-hmm. is it making a difference? And and it is. So there's that's, a lot of things. That, we, that's just obsession. amazing. Just the fact that you can sit back and just think about all the success from it, mm-hmm. and the thing that you just started this by yourself, this one small thing, and you're really affecting people's lives. So that's I can. I can't even imagine the feeling. Honestly. It's wonderful, and it goes way beyond me. There's so many other people doing this. It's not just me. Mm-hmm. It's really a team effort. There's lots of people out doing this stuff, and it's continuing to grow. More people want to get trained in it. More people want to do it. That's that's amazing. 
Maybe, Maybe we'll get to Ghana and see our friends. <laughs> oh, see yeah. our friends yeah. in Ghana, Ghana. that are listening Live to us. Live Africa. We, we just bring us there. We'll do a marriage retreat in Ghana. That would be. Wouldn't that be? That, wouldn't that be? That'd be that'd a great, be great story right there. That'd be so yeah. great. I need. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there. So, with all of that being said, what is the biggest thing you've had to learn? Whether it's business, relationship, what is that one big thing that stands out? <clears throat> well, I, I would. Well, there's a lot of them. One of them I would say is the whole idea of self leadership, because <clears throat> there's different types of leadership. Most people think of leadership as that you're leading other people. You're the like a general and the you know all the all the soldiers. Mm-hmm. Sir, yes, sir, right? Uh, and that is a form of leadership. That's the most obvious one. There's also peer to peer leadership. You know, where peer iron sharpens iron. And they're leading each other, and they're trusting each other, and walking through a journey together, and no one's above anybody else. <clears throat> and then there's the, you know, there's the self leadership where you lead, lead yourself. Um, you can also lead people above you. So you know, you can lead me. Hey, Richard, I need you to do a podcast. You know, I want you to come do this, and and, and you can lead the people above you too. So there's all these different types of leadership, but the one that gets neglected is self leadership. That's the one that most leaders fail because they don't lead themselves they don't center themselves they don't start off the day slow they don't they're not grounded and so i again that's a, something i've tried to make a priority <laughs> right. i don't do it 100 percent, you know uh, all the, but I, it is a very important goal of my life to make sure i'm focused and centered every day and starting that off and making sure that i'm leading myself because if i'm not leading myself i can't lead anybody else and um a lot, of, a lot of times, I mean, there's a biblical example of the whole thing of leadership is everyone having a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. And I have had several men that I respect that I've looked up to, and they said, Richard, if you're going to make it, if you're going to go through this, every leader that I've known that's been successful, they have, my mentors have told me, they've had a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. You've got someone above you, a mentor that's older than you, that's wiser than you, that, that kind of helps you navigate through the minefields and mm-hmm. learn from mistakes, and, and they're, they're there to love you no matter what. Um, that's a Paul. Then you have the Barnabases that are your peers, that they're leading you together, and then they're um, you know, iron sharpening iron. That's important to have a Barnabas. And then Timothy, those people under you that you're leading, and you're leading them well, and you're trying to lift them up and have them be become even more so Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy is very important. And then on top of that, the one more that I add is that self-leadership thing because that's that one's the one that gets neglected. Yeah, I, me even listening, yeah. I can, <laughs> that one hit. <laughs> that definitely hit. Yeah. So even, I, even though I think that's a perfect tidbit of wisdom right there, mm-hmm. if you could give wisdom to somebody listening to this episode who is thinking of stepping out in faith, what would you tell them? Well, <clears throat> only attempt to do things that are that are bound to fail unless the Lord bails you out. Get out get out on that limb so far, you're gonna fail. Unless God intervenes, you're toast. Um because we we all we like to play it safe. We like to think about that. I mean, you you think about the scripture with a, a Peter when the storm was out there and <clears throat> and everyone thought from a human perspective well, we got to be in the boat, you know, because it's, it's rocky water. It's, it's rough. There's lightning. There's storms. There's wind. It's scary. Oh, hang on to the boat as tight as we can. Peter was the only one that understood what was really going on. The safest place out on that lake was not in the boat. <laughs> the safest place out on that lake was where? Right next to Jesus. That's the safest place. He's out there on the water. I got to go out there. I got to go out to where he is. It's not safe on this boat. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, you know, even starting to live a life. People, when we first started, some of my friends, Richard, are you out of your mind? You don't have any savings. You don't have any, you know, wealthy people, you know, just just pouring everything and just making everything. You know, you've got kids that want to eat. I remember one friend in particular says, your kids like to eat. (laughs) They want to eat food. They they like having a roof over their head. Are you sure you want to do this? But the safest place is out there in the storm with Jesus, right next to him. Mm -hmm. So Peter is the only one that actually got to experience that. And he took, what, a couple steps. Mm -hmm. And they started to doubt. And then he started to 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 sink. And then what happened happened immediately when he started to sink? Jesus reaches out and grabs him. What a beautiful picture that is because, because he was willing to take that leap of faith, literally a leap of faith. He's the only human being that ever got to walk on water other than Jesus, right? Why? Because he left the safety. See, at the time when I started to live alive, I had a great job. I had benefits. I had retirement. I had health insurance. 
we left all that, and we didn't have any health insurance. We had no <laughs> retirement. We had no stable income. We had nothing. But that was the safest place to be. And because we take those leaps of faith, the Lord has, that's kind of how he honors it. Get, you're getting out there so far, you are going to fail. So if you're wanting to do that, get confirmation. You know, if you feel called to do something, that you want to do something that's, that's that advancing the kingdom, talk to other people and get confirmation. You're going to get people that are going to discourage you and say, oh, don't do that. You, do you want to eat? Do you want to, you know, you want eat? believers. These were believers that said this to me. No way. Yeah. So, you know, there, there will be some out there that will discourage and or be like, oh, I'm not so sure about that. But there will also be people, if it's from God, there will be people and it will, it will reinforce that and will confirm it and then will encourage you. You know what? That's, that's a good call. I think you should do it. I think that's a good, and, and by the way, and I'll go with you. That's another great thing is you meet people that I'll go on that journey with you and I'll, I'll help you. I'll help you do that. And those are the people you really remember. So when I talked to a group, when we had that, that Gary Chapman thing, what, a year or so ago, and there's a thousand people in the room, and I'm thinking how thankful I am that there's a thousand people. I look at the, up out in the audience and I see four or five people out there in that audience that were there with us from the beginning, that stood by us. Those are the ones that I remember. I mean, I remember, I remember, I love everyone that helps us and it's fantastic. But you remember those folks that were there from day one that stood by you and, and did that. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's otherwise, if you don't do these, take these leaps of faith, then you live your life wondering, I wonder what might have happened. Yeah. If only I had done this. If only I had, done, well, I should have tried. Maybe if I could have, would have, should have. And then you live all this life of regret. So mm -hmm. it's the it's the greatest adventure. It's the highest highs, and it is also the, the lowest, lowest lows. lows. Yeah. It's very much the lowest lows. It's everything in between. Mm -hmm. But, you know, God does have a plan for everybody. There is a plan for your life. There's something he wants you to do. There's a mission he wants you to accomplish. There's something he wants you to do with your life. And you're not going to be happy until you're doing it. It doesn't mean you have to go into a Christian ministry or it doesn't, it, you could, it doesn't have to be vocational. It could be as a volunteer. In other words, if this is what you, you can do it over here as a volunteer, you, you pay the bills over here. Paul made tents. Wasn't Paul the tent maker? So he's making money over here. So he gets to do this over here. That's his calling, but he did have to pay the bills, right? So yeah. he did things over here. So you don't, it, people think, well, that means I have to quit my job and go to Africa and be a missionary. No, God calls you to do something that you want to do. If you want to be the missionary to go to Africa, that's because you want to do it and you're excited about it. You're like, I can't wait to go to Africa. But very often it's something he's going to call you to do something that resonates deep in your soul. When I'm doing this, I'm hitting yeah. all cylinders. Yeah. I'm just, I'm crack-a-lacking. So, I mean, I could go yeah. on and on and on. You guys get For the idea. For sure. And I think it's wow. very interesting how you talked about, you know, meet Jesus in the safe. He was a safety in the storm and how, you know, you're, we're really battling the storm that is probably one of this generation's biggest storm, which is marriage and the family and how everything from human trafficking to domestic violence to pornography use to literally any social issue will, like the research says, will point back to the family. Was the family healthy? And so that's the storm that we are in. And that's the storm that, you know, 23 years ago, you decided this is the storm we're going to enter and we're going to fight against. And I just think like it has been such a crazy, amazing, wonderful, sometimes, you know, detrimental, but sometimes <laughs> amazing, you know, a incredible story. Um, and just that program that you were talking about, Adventures in Marriage, how amazing is it that we get to offer that for free now in our community? Yep. We get to do through our Healthy Marriage Initiative grant, we get to offer free Adventures in Marriage classes um, in our area, in Tallahassee, in Jacksonville, Panama City, South Florida. If you're in any of those regions and you're interested, please reach out to us on our website, livethelife.org, and we, we would love to provide that for your organization, for your church. Um, that's something that we are so excited about because this program has been proven to be so effective in couples. And so I just want to thank everyone for listening. I hope you guys feel encouraged, educated, and empowered to thrive in whatever relationship you're in. Have a good one.